Peach Blossom Debt Chapter 23 Tianzhu was Du Wanming. And Nanming, I remembered him too. He was called Zhang Zhang Duo. No wonder he kept staring daggers at me after I ascended to the heavenly court. In truth, I had no grudges against him back then in the mortal world. His father was a second-grade military general, lower than my father's rank, so during the new year and other festivities, his father would often send tributes of respect to my family. But this lad had had a backbone since he was a child, and he never came with his father to come calling at my house. I remember the name Du Wanming as a nightmare in my childhood. His father and my old man were both successful imperial examination candidates from the same batch of scholars, but his father's road to promotion had not run as smoothly as my father's, and he would later go on to become an imperial censor a thankless job. Du Wanming was the same age as me. Even then, he was renowned as a child prodigy, and my father often compared me to him. Du Wanming could recite Mencius backward when he was three years old, yet I would stammer even reading the first two lines of the Analects of Confucius at the same age. At five years old, Du Wanming could imitate the strokes of master calligraphers Wang Zizi and Wang Zianzi, whereas my handwriting was still chicken scratch. When he was seven, his prose poetry, Ode to the Orchids, was widely read throughout the capital, but at the same age of seven, I was not even sure what a poetic antithesis was. All day and all night long, my old man was envious of the Du clan's son, and it grieved him bitterly that no matter how he looked at it, his son that was me failed to live up to his expectations. When his heartache got too much, he would give me a taste of the rod. My father often lamented with a sigh, I may have been lucky in my official career, rising above all the others, but several years later, when my son becomes an adult, the songs would be hard-pressed to match up to the dues. All the officials who served in the same administration as my father pooled money together to build a private school where they could send their sons to study. Its true purpose was to give a place for their descendants to build close friendships from youth, so that when they joined the imperial court as officials in the future, they could mutually look out for one another and pave the road forward. When I was ten, Du Wanming enrolled in the private school, and my old man instantly kicked me into the same school. After I enrolled, I promptly discovered that there were many who were in the same shoes as me. Growing up, everyone had been compared to Du Wanming by their parents and suffered no end of grief. So, seeing the source of their troubles, they would gnash their teeth in resentment, and from time to time, they would find an excuse to take it out on Du Wanming himself. Du Wanming looked frail and delicate, and he was a pushover to boot. If someone were to bully him, he would endure it in silence, without a single word, which only invoked everyone's desire to do it again. This went on and on, and the bullying he suffered worsened by the day. The Du clan and the Zhang clan the latter being the family of the great and mighty general were neighbors, so Du Wanming and Zhang Zhang Duo grew up together, and Zhang Zhang Duo stood up for him. Their relationship was originally quite good. But one day, when I was passing by under the covered walkway on occasion, I saw a book, all covered in dirty water, lying in a puddle of mud in the yard. I thought someone had dropped it, so I picked it up and wiped off the muddy water with my sleeve. I was still in the midst of wiping it when I looked up and saw Du Wanming standing before me silently watching. That was how I knew this book was his. Looked like the other children had thrown it into the puddle. I felt that since I had already picked it up and cleaned it, and seeing how pitiful Du Wanming looked, I might as well do him a favor and return it. So, I handed the book to him. He thanked me softly, and I magnanimously said a you are welcome before returning to the classroom. That afternoon, I lost focus and got caught sleeping in the middle of our lessons. As I was a repeat offender, the teacher flew into a rage and sent me to the yard to kneel and copy the treatise of prudent conduct ten times as my punishment. My heart was not really in it as I copied, and by the time class was dismissed at dusk, I had only written it four times. Seeing as everyone had left, I grew anxious that I would never finish. It was at this time that someone walked over to my side and bumped as if unintentionally into the pile of papers that I had copied and stacked, 
sending it scattering to the ground. I looked up. It was Du Wanming. I was just about to curse when he squatted down and helped me to straighten out the pile. I watched as he slid out a roll of papers from his sleeve. Without even batting an eyelid, he unfurled it and stacked it on top of my barely completed pile. Then he got up and left. I looked askance at it. To my surprise, those papers were actually copies of the treatise of prudent conduct, and the handwriting on it was exactly the same as mine. I counted them, his stack had five copies done. Delighted, I wrote another one to make up the ten, and handed them over to the teacher. The next day, I pulled Du Wanming over to a secluded corner and asked how he was able to imitate my handwriting. I often copy books for my elder brothers at home, so I can imitate other people's handwriting, Du Wanming explained. You helped me yesterday, so consider those few copies a token of my gratitude. This was unexpected. He really knew how to repay my kindness. Such an ability was simply too good to be true. Solemnly, I asked him, then, if I help you again the next time, will you thank me again the same way? You've helped me before, Du Wanming said, so just tell me if there is anything I can help you with. And that was when I decided to take him under my protection. As my old man's official rank was higher than the others, the majority of the children in this private school took my lead and did as I said, so when I said I had taken Du Wanming under my protection, the bullying lessened. I also spoke of his ability to a few others who were on good terms with me, and as the news spread to the rest of our school, all at once, no one bullied Du Wanming anymore. They even fawned on him from time to time in order to get off doing a homework assignment. However, I fended them off, fearing that if he was too swamped with other people's homework, he would not do a good job of mine. Other than myself, he was allowed to help two others at most. The other schoolmates could only twiddle their thumbs, waiting for their scheduled turns, with this one's homework reserved for today and that one's reserved for tomorrow. Just as everyone was getting along harmoniously with one another, Zhang Zongduo just had to start stirring up trouble. When he saw Du Wanming playing with me, he found some unreasonable fault with him and reproached him. Since I had already taken Du Wanming under my protection, I naturally could not let Zhang Zongduo bully him so I shielded him from his tirades every time. Du Wanming helped me with my homework every day, so of course I would not treat him shabbily. I took him to play with crickets, catch grass hoppers, and fly kites, and I also counted him in when I played guessing games and dice and headed out to the fields in the countryside to steal wheat. I even gifted him a gourd for the crickets, a cage for the grasshopper, and the newest style of kite from Jiangnan that my old man's pupil had brought back to give me. After we started playing together, I realized that Du Wanming was actually not that bad a person. He was a loyal friend, and quite sweet-tempered. One time, I took him to an abandoned house on the outskirts of the city to catch crickets, and though he was saved from falling into a well, a piece of jade slipped from the string around his neck and dropped in. There was a plop, and then it was gone. I stole a piece of my mother's precious jade to make it up to him. My mother did not really have that much of a reaction after learning that I was the one who had taken the jade. My father, on the other hand, flew into a rage and gave me such a thrashing with the big rod that I ended up limping for five or six days. We stayed in the private school together for five years. When I left school five years later, it was just in time for that youthful period of my life where I was fond of cavorting around. Joined by three or five like-minded buddies I knew from the private school, I traversed all over the capital city on horseback, drinking wine, seeking merriment, and visiting courtesans. I grew more and more distant from Du Wanming. As someone with great expectations placed on his shoulders, he devoted his time to studying at home behind closed doors. At sixteen years old, the emperor personally appointed him as the top scholar. He was bestowed with a fourth-grade official post and joined the Hanlin Academy. My former schoolmates and I went together to congratulate him, and even though he was wearing the official attire of the Hanlin Academy, his attitude was still as modest and amicable as ever. 
This worked my father up so much that he would sigh and groan whenever he saw this face of mine. Fortunately, my mother was rather philosophical about it. What does it matter if our son can pass the imperial examination or not? All it takes is a word if he wants to be an official. He's still young, and if he joins the official circle, he will only be on the losing end for nothing. Might as well let him enjoy his freedom for a few years. Let's get his marriage arranged first. Once he's married, he'll mature and settle down naturally. It wouldn't be too late for him to be an official then. My old man, thus convinced by my mother's words, finally took it in his stride. But who knew that things would not work out as expected? His son who was not only incapable of attaining scholarly honor or official rank, but was even doomed to a fate of eternal solitude. The betrothals fell through one after another, and all those who caught my eye fled one after another. For all the flowers whom I courted over several years, I could not get my hands on even a fraction of their pollen. My reputation as someone doomed to a fate of eternal solitude spread all over the capital, becoming a joke. Even the emperor struggled to fight his laughter whenever the topic of my marriage was broached in my presence. I was disconsolate. When I fell out of love the first or second time, that roguish company of friends would comfort me and drink with me to drown my sorrows. But as the frequency of these events grew, their first reaction when I sought them out became a burst of laughter before anything else. And so, I went to drown my sorrows by my lonely, lonesome self. One day, as I was drinking my heartbreak away in a small wine tavern, I bumped into Du Wanming, who had just been dismissed from a court session. He did not have many words of comfort to say, but he was willing to listen to me pour out my woes, even drank with me. I did not expect him to still treat me as a friend after all these years without contact. So, when I got my heart broken again, utterly crushed, I dragged him out for a couple of drinks. Not once did he ever make fun of me. It was at the time when the emperor's younger sister finally married her little vice minister after an unsuccessful attempt to make me a stand-in father for her unborn child that something big happened in the imperial court. Du Wanming's imperial censor father was implicated in an old case that occurred before the emperor's accession to the throne, and investigations showed that he had connections to the old faction of the prince who had revolted. As such, Du Wanming's family was convicted of treason. His entire clan was executed, and their family properties, confiscated. That was the day Zhang Zong Duo came to call on my house for the very first time ever. Forthright as he was, he got straight to the point as soon as he saw me. On account of your friendship with Du Wanming over the years, you should save him. I don't need you to remind me, I said. Truth be told, I've already saved him. The emperor had stolen away the wife I had yet to marry, and his younger sister almost made me a cuckold by making me a stand-in father to her child conceived out of wedlock. By all accounts, he owed me twice. On top of that, the emperor had also once mentioned that imperial censor Du's crime was merely a criminal charge, but as it involved the throne, he had no choice but to mete out the punishment. Then he had also lamented whether wittingly or unwittingly what a shame it was about Du Wanming. So, I rescued Du Wanming from death row by replacing him with a corpse and saying that he had met with sudden death. To this, the emperor said nothing. I settled Du Wanming down in a small courtyard on the outskirts of the capital city and often went to visit and play chess with him. I did not really read much of the classics, so I could not discuss those with him, and when it came to chess, I could not beat him either. He was in poor health and often had difficulty sleeping, so there were times we played till daybreak. The enclosing walls around the courtyard were adorned all over with climbing vines, with the luxuriant bloom of Lady Banks' roses in spring. Sometimes after a night of chess, I would step out of the chamber early in the morning to be greeted with the particularly rich and pleasing fragrance of the roses in the morning mist. The physician said that this fragrance could alleviate the stifling tightness in Du Wanming's chest. Du Wanming did not weep his gratitude to me for saving him. His entire family had been beheaded, and he was now mostly a shell of his former self. He merely asked me once. With little emotion, 
if I was not afraid of being implicated in saving him, given the many risks involved. I thought, did you think I would do something I knew was futile? Of course I had long known that the Emperor would not pursue the matter. And besides, we were friends, I would certainly help him if it was in my power and ability to do so. Perhaps it was true what they say, no good deeds go unrewarded. Not long after settling Du Wanming in, I gave a sudden glance back at the streets and saw Ye Oxiang. I still felt a little heartsick remembering this name now. I fell in love with Ye Oxiang at first sight, and was genuinely and wholeheartedly in love with her. I did all I could to please her every day, even going as far as to ask Du Wanming for advice about some lovey-dovey poems and romantic prose to share with her. In order to support and provide for her scholar, she pretended to treat me well. I was basking in the flush of love every day. However, Du Wanming's health deteriorated by the day. He had been tortured in prison, and the physician said his spleen was injured, to have lived past just a few days was already a feat. Fortunately, he did not suffer much at the end. He passed out from the pain twice and slept it away, and the last time he woke up, he even said thank you to me for taking care of him all these days. When he closed his eyes, he looked rather serene. He even left me a stack of copied poems so that I could recite them to Ye Oxiang. I buried him by the Emerald Hillside on the city outskirts and gave special instructions to have someone watch over the grave mound. After that, Ye Oxiang still got together with her poor scholar, and I ended up empty-handed with nothing to show for my efforts. Forlorn, I bought wine to drink myself drunk. There were still two books of poems in the residence that Du Wanming had left behind, and these bitter poems and tragic verses resonated with me. I was heartbroken from the double ninth festival to the next year's Dragon Boat Festival. Then the words Ye Oxiang said to me in the temple dealt me such a huge blow that I saw stars. After that, I crossed the street and asked for a bowl of wonton noodles. And after that, I ascended and became immortal Song Yao. Heng Wen listened to me without saying a word. I grasped his sleeve. I have no idea how the heavenly court came to twist the story this way, but this is the real story. Actually, Heng Wen said slowly, there is really no difference between your version and the heavenly court's version. I looked at the little finger on my left hand, and my heart went cold. Heng Wen, tell me the truth. I always thought it was a coincidence that I could ascend to the heavenly court, but in truth, is it related to the fact that Tian Chu and I are connected by this thread? Tian Chu. Du Wanming. Since Tian Chu was Du Wanming, even still keeping the jade I had given him, I would have been a familiar face after my ascension to the heavenly court. So why had he always put on a cold, indifferent attitude and pretended not to know me? Not quite, Heng Wen said. The thread on both Tian Chu's and your hands have turned into dead knots, but you were, after all, a mortal. As long as you undergo five lifetimes of reincarnation in the mortal world without meeting Tian Chu, the thread would naturally break off on its own. But Heng Wen cast a resigned look at me. You sure are blessed with good fortune. It just so happened that Tai's Hang Lao Jun's immortal elixir fell into the human world, and you happened to eat it and ascended. So what if I became an immortal? Heng Wen sighed. Perhaps this is a fate beyond the control of even immortals. As long as you have become an immortal, and whether or not you remain an immortal after the fact, this thread is said to be unbreakable unless you or Tian Chu is obliterated into oblivion. I looked at that glossy, golden thread and flicked it with a finger. There was no sensation of having touched it, yet it quivered ever so softly. If it can't be undone, then all I can do is leave it bound, I said. What is the consequence if I leave it on? They called it a thread of a mortal bond, but I had it on for many years having served no particular purpose. It's precisely because there is a consequence that Tian Chu Sing Jun pretended not to recognize you at first and kept his distance from you in the heavenly court, Heng Wen said. The time he attempted to have you banished to the mortal realm had also been for the sake of protecting you. I remember telling you before that immortals born in the heavenly court, such as Tian Chu and myself, have our duties all determined even before we took on forms. 
that is why I only have a title and not even a name like a mortal would. The same goes for Tianchu. He was born to take charge of the Baidu Palace. As the Star of Emperors, he is destined to reciprocate and complement Nanming Dijun. Understanding immediately dawned on me. I get it now. I butted in between them and severed the thread between Tianchu and Nanming, while getting myself hooked up to Tianchu. As a result, I messed up the mutual reciprocity between these two lords. But not once had I ever harbored the intent to come between them, so why did this thread have to take it as an interference on my part and insist on securing itself to me? And yet you just so happened to pick up an immortal elixir that fell out of the blue. That's quite the luck, Heng Wen quipped with a wry smile. You ascended and became an immortal, and the thread was no longer breakable unless one of you were obliterated. Although Tianxia Xing Jun intended to keep his distance from you, both of you were still connected by the thread. Nanming Dijun took this to heart and bore a grudge, and the two lords gradually drifted apart. Calamities and wars became frequent occurrences in the mortal world, and dynasties, unable to achieve stabilization, rose and fell in mere instants. To the heavenly court, this thread cannot be retained, but to sever it, it's either you or Tianchu who has to go. If you were the Jade Emperor, who, between yourself and Tianchu, would you retain? Tianchu. My answer was immediate. Heng Wen turned his head aside to look at me. I sighed. You can skip the rest of it. I can guess it myself. The Jade Emperor wanted to annihilate me even before that doctrine dialogue, didn't he? That was why Tianchu attempted to find an excuse to send me down to the mortal world. In that case, why did the Jade Emperor design this whole show, saying that Nanming and Tianchu were banished to the mortal world because of their illicit affair and having me set up trials to break the lovebirds apart? This was the part Minga Sing Jun hemmed and hawed over when he told me the whole story earlier, Heng Wen said. It was only when I pressed him further that he told me the truth. Turns out, this whole idea was originally his. Old man Minga. I just knew it. He always has to get himself involved in every single matter. Resigned, Heng Wen continued, in this case, Minga did it out of good intentions to save you. You should thank him instead. The various immortals have developed some friendship with you all these years you have been in the heavenly court, and they can't bear to see you obliterated. For that reason, Minga told the Jade Emperor that while a dead knot cannot be undone unless one party is obliterated, you ascended under unusual circumstances and never once developed feelings for Tianchu in all your years. He argued that there may be other ways to resolve this issue. Then Yu Lao added that it was a great sin to destroy others' marriage predestined by fate, which would ruin the person's own marriage as a karmic retribution. So Minga came up with this idea, and Tianchu told the Jade Emperor that he was willing to give it a try. Besides, Nanming's ruthlessness toward Qingtong and Zhilin meant that there was a debt to be repaid. And that was how you came to descend to the mortal world. It all made sense now. All the strange occurrences during this descent into the mortal world suddenly had an explanation. In all probability, Minga Xing Jun was the one who had told Shan Shengling about the immortal herb. That was how Shan Shengling, a mere mortal, knew to steal it to save Mu Ruian's life. I looked at the lotus pond, adorned with lotus leaves as green as jade. Heng Wen said, You really do owe Tianchu a lot. Do Wan Ming. Tianchu Xing Jun. Looking back on it now, I still felt that I had not treated Du Wanming the best. I would have done the same for someone else, but this act had indeed severed his bond and reconnected to mine. And by the end of it all, it had become a dead knot. Du Wanming had lived simply and was sweet-tempered. His appearance differed from Tianxia's seeing Jun too. No matter how I looked at it, I could not have imagined him to be the cold Tianchu. I had inflicted Mu Ruyin with all sorts of abhorrent deeds. To protect me, Tianchu had been willing to descend to the mortal world to undergo tribulations, and yet I treated him in such a way. What was he thinking now? And just how was I supposed to repay him for all I owed him? Heng Wen did not say anything more, and sat side by side with me at the lotus pond. I looked again at my hand. 
I wonder if the thread will be gone if I hack off this finger. Now. You wish, Heng Wen laughed. I'd like you to hack it off too. If it worked, the Jade Emperor would have done so long ago. Without your little finger, it can still secure itself elsewhere. Unless. Unless I was completely obliterated, and there was nowhere for it to bind itself to. I let out too quiet, Rai laughs. Heng Wen and I said nothing more as we remained sitting. After a while, I said, the Jade Emperor ordered me to go over to Minga Sing Jun, so I'd better get going. I stood. All right, Heng Wen said. I heard Xian Li has also been brought over to the Heavenly Court. I'll go check in on him. He rose to his feet, and I looked at him, but I did not know what to say. Then, this is farewell, I guess, Heng Wen said. Farewell, I said. I watched as Heng Wen turned around and left. His back gradually receded into the distance, and for a fleeting moment, it was like I had just ascended to the heavenly court for the first time. During that first encounter, I had also watched his back from afar as he gradually walked further and further away from me. I expelled a sigh of chilly air and entered Minga Sing Jun's residence through the back door. End chapter Peach Blossom Debt Chapter 24 I had just stepped through the back door when the young immortal attendant said to me, You're finally here, Song Yao Yu and Jun. Sing Jun has already been waiting for you for half a day. He led me through several roof ridges and doors to a large pond enveloped in mist. Minga Sing Jun sat cross-legged by the pond, seemingly in repose with his eyes closed. Mist rose from the steaming water in the pond. Could there possibly be hot springs in the heavenly court too? Old man Minga sure knew how to enjoy life, having a hot spring at home to soak in every now and then. After the young immortal attendant led me to the side of the pond, he bowed and withdrew. I approached Minga Sing Jun. With eyes still tightly shut, Minga Sing Jun suddenly heaved a long sigh and recited, Alas! Every bite and every drink are all foreordained, cause begets effect such is the way of the universe. He sighed so ominously that my hair stood on end. There was going to be a doctrine dialogue these days. Don't tell me Minga Sing Jun has already gone over to the Western Paradise for tea, too? I lifted the corner of my robe and sat down. Sing Jun, you can drop all those subtle Buddhist allegories from the Western Paradise. The Jade Emperor ordered me to come and hear the whole story from you, so please get to the point. Minga Sing Jun opened his eyes to look at me, then let loose another long sigh. This hot spring looks good, I remarked. What hot spring? Minga Sing Jun said. That's the fate gazing pond. It allows you to see future events. Caught in mid reach to stir the water, I immediately retracted my hand in embarrassment. Heng Wen Ching Jun came to me after he returned to the heavenly court, Minga Sing Jun said and I have already told him the whole story about you and Tianchu. Ching Jun should have already told you all about it. That's right, I answered. We sat by the pond for half the day, and he told me everything. Minga Sing Jun looked at me with compassion. Slowly, he asked, Song Yao Yu and Jun, do you know what your greatest mistake during your trip to the mortal world was? The Jade Emperor had asked me the same thing back at the Peach of Immortality Garden. His venerable self seemed to have already told me the answer. At the time, I had been unable to make head or tail of it, but now, I was completely clear. I should not have seduced Heng Wen Ching Jun while I was still bound to Tian Zhe Sing Jun, I replied. Or seduced him into giving mortal love a try. Minga Sing Jun still looked at me with compassion. Not fully closing his eyes, he said, wrong. You should not have let Heng Wen Ching Jun know of mortal love, then involve that fox. What Heng Wen told me by the side of the lotus pond about the thread and Du Wanming had been like a bolt out of the blue that left me thunderstruck. But now, my mind was in such an absolute state of primal chaos that I might as well have been literally struck by lightning. I staggered out of Minga Sing Jun's residence. Minga had reached his hands into the fate-gazing pond, 
the spirals of mist that had risen transforming into an image of Heng Wen sleeping on the couch, where a snowy white fox had lowered its head, licking Heng Wen's lips. The mist had changed, producing another image. Heng Wen was standing by the heavenly river, and a man was standing beside him. All I could see were his fluttering clothes, not his appearance, but even so, I could tell that I was not that man. Back then, when Heng Wen Ching Jun was just born, the Jade Emperor ordered me to divine his fate for him, Minga Sing Jun had said. It was foretold that Heng Wen Ching Jun was destined to undergo a love tribulation in his life. With this snow fox spirit. Song Yao Yu and Jun, Minga Sing Jun had continued, that day, you should never have made Heng Wen Ching Jun understand mortal love, then allowed this fox to get close to Heng Wen Ching Jun. You should never have let this fox risk all its cultivation to save Heng Wen Ching Jun, Minga Sing Jun had said. Heng Wen Ching Jun owes him a thousand years of cultivation and a debt of gratitude for saving his life. And you have to know that a debt owed is a debt to be repaid. The Jade Emperor initially thought that your only role was as the variable that had interfered with Tian Chi Sing Jun's and Nanming De Jun's destined fate, Minga Sing Jun added. Who would have expected you to also be the go-between for Heng Wen Ching Jun and that fox? A debt owed naturally must be repaid. Tian Chu and I were bound by the thread of a mortal bond. Minga Sing Jun had said that he owed me a debt from the lifetime when he was Du Wanming. That was why he had protected me in the heavenly court and suffered so much. The fox, enamored with Heng Wen, risked its life and a thousand years of cultivation. Heng Wen owed the fox, and now, I owed Tian Chu again. So it turned out that all predestined affinities were merely debts to be repaid. So it turned out that Heng Wen's destined lot was the fox. I staggered on the secluded path I was now walking, and could not help but give a bitter laugh. I had been an immortal in the heavenly court and had seen countless immortals, but in truth, the one who divined my fortune back then was the real immortal. As expected, I was still doomed to a fate of eternal solitude. Tian Chu Sing Jun and Nanming Di Jun were made for each other. I was the one who got in the way and messed up their fates. Heng Wen Ching Jun was destined to undergo a love tribulation with a fox, and I, acting as the matchmaker, eventually made this a reality. Each had their own predestined affinity, just not with me. I was doomed to play supporting roles in these tales. If not a rod to serve as relationship wrecker, then a bridge to act as go-between. I walked to Yeo Guang Palace, and the heavenly soldiers on duty raised their halberds to intercept me. Could you gentlemen please do me a favor? I said. I come bearing no intention except to see Tian Chi Sing Jun. The heavenly soldiers studied me, their faces giving nothing away. He Yun stepped out from the side. The Jade Emperor did not prohibit Song Yao Yu and Jun from visiting Tian Chi Sing Jun. Just let him in. Much obliged, I cupped my hands at He Yun, and he gave me a slight nod of his head in return. I strode into Yeo Guang Palace. It was spacious but empty inside. I saw Tian Chi standing before the window. As I approached him, Tian Chi turned around and suddenly said to me, Everyone in that city died, right? I went momentarily blank. When the snow lion went berserk, Tian Chi repeated, Everyone in Liu Yang city died, didn't they? It then dawned on me the incident he spoke of. Knowing Tian Chi's temperament, he would no doubt blame himself for this incident. Thus, I said, the snow lion suddenly went berserk. If you must blame someone, the responsibility lies on Minga, who writes the fates. Just have Yan Wang arrange a good reincarnation for the people of the city when they arrive in the underworld. Tian Chu merely smiled. He had now reverted to his true form. As he was awaiting punishment, he simply wore a plain white robe looking still as cold and indifferent as he always did. I hesitated for a moment before saying, I never did make you out to be Du Wanming. I'm sorry. It is of no consequence, Tian Chi said. I should be the one apologizing to you. It was supposed to be a casual acquaintance between us for one lifetime, nothing more, but... You ended up getting implicated and bound to the thread of a mortal bond. 
I'm much obliged to you for taking care of me when I was in the mortal world, so I wanted to see you. I thought I would never get to see you again, but here you are. I lowered my head. Don't bring up the mortal world. I feel even more ashamed at the mention of it. I treated you in every rotten way possible while there, and yet you have been helping me all this time I've been in heaven. I... I owe you too much. This is all my fault, and I've dragged you down with me. The Jade Emperor knows the whole story, so he'll surely release you. Tianxi smiled again. You sound like you are here to apologize and beg for forgiveness. I sputtered out a dry laugh. Tianchu and I were bound by the thread of a mortal bond, but for some reason, our conversations were still extremely awkward. You feel you have implicated me and got me into trouble, Tianchu said, and I, too, feel that I have implicated you. The truth is that I actually owe Nanming Dijun a lot. This debt. Here and that debt there who can really say for sure. Tianchu turned aside and looked out of the window. Actually, I've been thinking ever since I returned from my time as Du Wanming that one might as well be immortal. It is enough just being in the courtyard, watching the change of seasons, and the blooming and wilting of the Lady Banks' roses. It trumps being in the heavenly court, embroiled in countless entanglements. Hearing his words, I sensed something amiss. I had enough experience dealing with Mu Ruyin in the mortal world to know that these sounded like Tianchu's last words. I strode a big step forward and grabbed his sleeve. As expected, he was like a flimsy piece of paper that fell limply over. The immortal aura on him was extremely weak, and his divine glow was so faint it had nearly extinguished. I exclaimed, Thunderstruck, what have you done? All these years of entanglements, I really am too tired. Tianchu said with a smile. Let's just forget about who owes whom. I no longer wish to care. I used a bit of my powers to probe an expanse of icy coldness. Tianchu had actually shattered his own immortal essence. To think he would be even more ruthless than when he had been Mu Ruian. He wanted to be obliterated, so much that he would not leave even a smidgen of opportunity for anyone to salvage the situation. Tianchu extended a hand to stuff a piece of jade into mine. You have looked out so much for me. In fact, you actually don't owe me a thing. Thank you, for all you did, those childhood days in the mortal world, his eyes closed as his head drooped. There seemed to be a stabbing pain on the base of my little finger, followed by a gradual loosening. Tianchu Xing Jun, do you really think you are beyond saving with this one move? So the immortal bond between us would prove useful after all. No matter when he sought death, I could always foil his attempts. I sighed and channeled a stream of immortal energy into his back, then took out something from the front of my robes and stuffed it into Tianchu's mouth. All at once, light enveloped his body. Not the silver light of Tianchu Xing Jun, but the blue light of Song Yao Yuan Jun. I said to the person shrouded in that light, Xing Jun, I'm sorry. You were friends with me when you were Du Wanming, so you should know that what I, Song Yao, fear the most in life is owing a debt. Even if you wouldn't let me repay this debt, I still have to repay it. From now on, when you regain your immortal body, all the past will be wiped clean, and as of this moment onward, you and I do not owe the other any more. I looked at that jade pendant in my hand, and with a gentle clench of my fist, crushed it completely into powder. I left Yeo Guang Palace. He Yun was standing right in front of the palace gate. I said, I've just talked to Tian Xing Jun, and he has seen the light. May I ask Envoy He to intercede with the Jade Emperor on his behalf? Let him have a moment of quiet these two days, and the rest can be discussed later. The Jade Emperor's initial order was to have Tian Xing Jun meditate for two days, He Yun said. So, you and Jun, you may rest assured. I thanked him and asked in a seemingly off-handed way, do you happen to know where that fox is locked up? The Jade Emperor has ordered Bi Hualing Jun to watch over it for the time being, He Yun answered. I took the walk to Bi Hualing Jun's residence. The young immortal attendant informed me that Ling Jun was not around, 
as he had been invited to tea by Heng Wen Ching Jun. Needless to say, Heng Wen must have asked Bi Hua to take good care of the fox. Bi Hua Ling Jun's absence suited my purpose one less sorrowful melodrama of farewells playing out. Can I see the fox that the Jade Emperor ordered Ling Jun to watch? I asked. Put in a spot, the young immortal attendant scrunched up his face. The Jade Emperor only gave the order to forbid Heng Wen Ching Jun from looking at it, didn't he? I said. So it doesn't matter if I look at it, right? The young immortal attendant thought about it carefully for a moment before acquiescing, all right. The young immortal attendant led me to a stone chamber in the backyard and opened the door. That fox is right in there. I'd like to see it alone, I said. Take your leave first and lock the door. All right, the young immortal attendant said, but be quick. I entered the stone chamber and heard the door click shut. The fox was lying on a prayer cushion set on a jade bed. Its fur was a dry, disheveled mess, and its head was resting on its front paws. On seeing me, it partially lifted its eyelids. I sat down on the edge of the bed. How are you doing, Furball? The fox closed its eyes and remained motionless. If the Jade Emperor forced you to stop liking Heng Wen Ching Jun, what would you do? I asked. The fox's ears twitched. What if the Jade Emperor flayed your skin and crushed your bones into ashes just to force you not to like Heng Wen Ching Jun? I probed. The fox's ears twitched again, its expression dauntless. Excellent. Then remember my words today, I said. Heng Wen prefers his tea mild. When he writes, he often sets his brush in the ink brush washer and forgets to keep it away. He has to drink himself drunk, or he'll never be done with it, so you can't let him have all the wine he wants. He doesn't have any bad habits when it comes to sleeping, but remember that he has to drink the first brew of Sparrow's Tongue Tea when he wakes up. He tends to forget the time when he reads official documents, so you have to drag him outdoors from time to time to take a breather. He has someone under his command. Called Lu Jing who will conjure out a pile of official documents at all hours for him to look over. There's no need for you to pay this immortal any attention. Be mindful when Dong Hua De Jun, Bi Hua Ling Jun, Tebei Sing Jun, and the others come looking for him to go drinking. He has a habit of forgetting and losing things. When he leaves his seat, check his table to see if there is a fan or something else that he forgot to take. He doesn't really eat sweet stuff, and even when it comes to fruit kernels or nuts, he only eats the salted ones, not the candied ones. His pillow has to be low, and his bedding has to be soft. Take note that his tea water should also be an agreeable temperature. The fox sat up and looked at me out of the corner of its eyes in puzzlement. Affably, I petted its head. Stay by Heng Wen's side from now on. The fox shivered under my palm. I sighed again and recited an incantation. A blue light materialized in my palm and enveloped the fox, going from a weak glow to a brilliant radiance before gradually diminishing. Eventually, it was all absorbed into the fox's body. The fox crouched on the cushion and looked at me in astonishment. Furbel, I said, you have half of my cultivation in you already. You can now take on human form again. With a little more cultivation, you'll be able to become an immortal. Furbel leaped to the ground and rolled to take on human form. Now that it had my cultivation, it seemed to be a tad more pleasing to the eyes. The fox looked at me. Why are you doing this? To tell you the truth, my immortal essence and the other half of my cultivation have already been given to someone else as a repayment of my debt, I explained. I am now being sustained by spells, and in a few days, I'll be reduced to nothing but ashes. This remaining half of my cultivation will be wiped out along with me, so I might as well give it to you. But I'm not giving it for nothing. The debt of gratitude that Heng Wen Ching Jun owes you for saving this life I've repaid it for him. From this moment on, he does not owe you anything. The fox looked at me, befuddled. Gradually, a hint of sorrow washed over his expression. This immortal lord found myself quite melancholic too. Soon enough, I would fade into oblivion. 
Do me a favor now, won't you? I said. I wish to see Heng Wen, but I don't want to see him in this state, so I'd like to borrow your appearance. Turn into me and leave this place first. You have my immortal aura on you, so the young immortal attendant can't tell the difference. Come back again after I get to see Heng Wen. You and Heng Wen have a predestined romantic relationship, so the Jade Emperor will not make things difficult for you. In all probability, you can remain by his side to cultivate. Later, when you become an immortal, remember all that I've told you. My last words outmatched Tianxia's in emotional impact. The rims of the fox's eyes even reddened just that little bit. All right, he answered in a hushed tone, then transformed into this immortal lord. Let me help you turn into me. You should reduce your use of the immortal arts, then you can, hang on a little longer. I turned into the fox and found the world had gotten a lot broader. Even that small prayer cushion had suddenly become bigger. Furble walked out, and I huddled down on the cushion. Sure enough, an immortal aura approached a moment later. The door to the stone chamber opened, and in came Bihawa. Bihawa walked over to the stone couch. He sighed, What am I to do with you, fox? Heng Wen Ching Jun insists on seeing you, but he can't come over to my residence. Behave yourself. This lord shall take you to see Heng Wen Ching Jun. Before I could nod, a bag swallowed my head, and everything before my eyes turned pitch black. I heard Bi Hualing Jun say, Stay in the bag and don't move. This lord will take you to see Heng Wen Ching Jun. I remained in the bag, sniffing at the scent seeping in through the fabric seam and, from time to time, vaguely determining where I was. After about a quarter of an hour, Bi Hualing Jun seemed to cross over an enclosing wall. That was when I knew we had probably arrived at Weiyuan Palace. Sure enough, after Bi Hualing Jun strode over a threshold, he said, Ching Jun, I've brought the fox over. The Jade Emperor will not put it on trial today, but you have to return it to me tomorrow. He set the bag along with this immortal lord on what seemed to be a board on the tabletop. Thank you, thank you, Heng Wen said, tones soft. Bi Hualing Jun bade farewell and left. Light appeared overhead from the opening of the bag. I looked up and saw Heng Wen. Looking up like this, Heng Wen's face appeared larger than usual, which meant I could also look at him even closer than usual. I tilted my neck up to look, but Heng Wen frowned, You don't seem to be Xian Li. I broke out in a cold sweat. Heng Wen's eyes were truly sharp. I shamelessly held my head up and wagged my tail. Heng Wen could not help but laugh. You are not Xian Li, but you do resemble it. Don't tell me the heavenly soldiers took the wrong one? Who could you possibly be? He petted the top of my head, and I turned my head and licked his hand. I barely had any immortal powers left in my body, so there was no chance of Heng Wen sousing out my identity. I licked his hand again and Heng Wen reached behind my two front paws to lift me up. Well then, we can say it was fated that you were brought to the heavenly court, and made it to my residence, no less. I'll play the host and let you stay for a day, then take you to the Jade Emperor tomorrow to have him release you back into the mortal world. I continued my brazen nodding, and wagged my tail again. I lay on the chair beside Heng Wen to keep him company as he looked over his documents which he did for quite a while. Then I rested on his lap for the time it took for him to leisurely finish two cups of tea. Heng Wen patted me on the back. A pity there's nothing you like to eat in the residence. I'll get some fine wine. Do you want some? He set a dish of the good wine before my paws. I lowered my head and drank it, then shamelessly wagged my tail yet again. Heng Wen laughed, the sound quite cheerful. When it was time to turn in, Heng Wen set a cushion on the chair beside the bed for me. I crouched on it, waited for him to lie down himself, then ricocheted myself off the ground and into his bed. You want to sleep on the bed too? Heng Wen asked in wonder. I looked ingratiatingly at him. Heng Wen sighed softly. Then so be it. He patted the empty spot beside him, 
and I lay down next to him. I curled up, sticking to Heng Wen with the quilt between us, and closed my eyes. I felt quite fulfilled. No wonder the fox was always designing to get into Heng Wen's bed. Truth be told, if I could accompany him like this even as a beast, I would be willing. Heng Wen seemed to have fallen sound asleep. I rose, shook my fur, and crouched by the pillow to watch him. Heng Wen, Heng Wen. Did you know? When I first saw you several thousand years ago, I only saw your back from afar as you left Weiyuan Palace. Just from that, it was from that time onward that I liked you. At that time, you were so high up above the masses and far beyond my reach, I could only gaze at you from a distance. But we would meet again by the Lotus Pond, and you would come to my residence. For several thousand years thereafter, you and I formed a friendship. But somehow, I always had the feeling that while you were near by my side, you were also so very far apart, and I still could not touch you. Perhaps, it was just as what Ye Oxiang said in the mortal world. The truth is that I had never come to understand what love was throughout all those years. I finally knew of this word after I ascended to the heavenly court, but this word would not avail itself to me. I have gained plenty from all that has transpired in the mortal world, and I think I have more than made up for all of it these few thousands of years. Even if I was only a bridge. Serving as a go-between, it was all worthwhile. I wish with all my heart to be a dutiful immortal who knows my place. I wholeheartedly wish to remain in the heavenly court, for the days of an immortal are long and never-ending. Even if I could not touch you, I would be content to remain by your side for time eternal. But here I am, looking at you like this. I'm in no one's debt, just like you. Destiny has decided that I cannot remain by your side, but to watch you and touch you like this now, that in itself already speaks of a deep affinity between us, does it not? I lowered my head to lick Heng Wen's lips, took another look at him, then jumped to the ground and left his chamber. The heavenly court was quiet all around. I wondered where the fox had wandered to in this immortal lord's guise. Let him be. At any rate, I had already told him to make his way back to Bihualing Jun's residence tomorrow. I reverted to my original form and encountered a few heavenly soldiers on the way, but perhaps the Jade Emperor had already given the instruction to allow me unimpeded access in the heavenly court, because heavenly soldiers did not really react when they saw me. I came before Taibei seeing Jun's residence. I did not have the capability to somersault over the wall anymore so I played by the rules and had the heavenly envoy announce my arrival. Jinxing, having already fallen asleep, came out to greet me with a disheveled beard and bleary eyes. Song Yao Yu and Jun, what can I do for you? I'd like to sneak out of the heavenly court and lie low, I said with an apologetic smile. Please think of a way for me to slip out of the heavenly court. Jinxing's beard promptly puffed up. You want to escape to the mortal world? Then what about Tianxia Xing Jun? What about Heng Wen Qing Jun? You drag these two immortal lords through your mess and now you want to flee all by yourself. I have no choice either, I said. Think about it, if I remain in the heavenly court, the Jade Emperor will go by the book and conduct a public trial in Ling Xiao Palace before all the various immortals. Even if I shoulder all the charges, Tianxia Xing Jun and Heng Wen Qing Jun will be punished along with me. So, I might as well escape to the mortal world where I can lie low, and all the charges will be pinned on me. That way, Tian Chu and Heng Wen will be fine. Your gears sure are turning hard. Jinxing gave me a quick glance, and stroked his beard with his hand. Oh, well. Let's see if I can sneak you out of the heavenly court today. Elated, I said, thank you, Xin Jun. No need to stand on ceremony. Taibei Sing Jun said. But don't blame me if your plan doesn't pan out as you hoped and ended up getting captured back again. I cupped my hands. Of course. Taibei Sing Jun covered me in a golden shield and concealed me in his sleeve, then straightened his clothes and stepped out of his residence. Through the slit in the opening of his sleeve, I could make out the southern heavenly gate. The heavenly soldier standing guard asked, Sing Jun, where are you headed? 
By order of the Jade Emperor, I'm heading to the mortal world to observe the present state of affairs in the world, Tebe Sing Jun answered. He handed over the gate tally, and the heavenly soldiers let him through. Tebe Sing Jun took me along as he descended to the mortal world and released me from the barrier. I looked around me we were on a mountaintop. You fled to the mortal world, Tebe Sing Jun said. As to where, this lord does not know. I reassured him that was the case. Then Tebe Sing Jun rose on the clouds and returned to the heavenly court. I struggled in my journey from the top of the mountain down to the middle. My immortal powers were exhausted. In an effort to conceal the drain from Tebe Sing Jun, I had consumed even more divine spells, and now I was on the verge of giving out. I found a cave among the shrubbery in the middle of the mountain and made my way in. It was pretty clean inside the cave, and the soil on the ground was very soft and flat. The entrance faced east, so when I lay down just so, I could see the morning mist and a ray of sunlight. The immortals of the heavenly court should be able to more or less understand what had happened once they saw Tianchu, and the sight of the fox should seal the deal. This was the best outcome. I was immortal to begin with, so even if I were to be reduced to ashes, I ought to return to the mortal world. Heng Wen would be a little less heartbroken if he did not see this happen with his eyes. He would also be able to get over it sooner. There was no denying the sadness welling in me as I faced eternal oblivion. I thought, if a wisp of my soul could be retained, even if I was a grass-dwelling bug, that would have been fine too. But when a beam of morning sun shone on me, I was suddenly enlightened. Whether I was a person doomed to a fate of eternal solitude, a rod meant to wreck relationships, or a bridge to act as go-between they were all just different facets of a life lived. Think of it from another perspective. All these years Heng Wen and I had in heaven were something no mortal could ever have, even if they had the chance to dream of it over several lifetimes. I got to be together with him, from dawn to dusk, from day to night. I was about to face eternal oblivion. I would no longer exist in the world and the world, to me. Heng Wen and I were together up to the point I turned to dust, and that was already lifetimes together, for time eternal. A sense of closure draped itself over me all at once. The immortal energy coursing through my body was already exhausted. It felt empty inside, and my vision began to blur. So, this was obliteration. That's all there is to it. In my days, I saw Heng Wen standing beside me. Mortals were known to develop hallucinations when they died, so it turned out that one would also hallucinate before being completely wiped from existence. It was nice to be able to get one more look at him even if it was but a mere illusion. End chapter